An unusual feature of Indian patronage was that the same person, if he so wished, could patronize more than one sect. Ashoka's appeal for tolerance was addressed to both Brahmins and Shamans. This was not secularism. The coexistence of, of opposing groups was what was being acknowledged. From time to time, some monks questioned aspects of belief and monastic regulations as specified by the <laughs> the latter being viewed as the orthodoxy. If the challenge was substantial, it could lead to a breakaway and the formation of another sect. There was a continuing emergence of sects, a format characteristic of both Shramana and Brahmana belief systems. This experience was common to other religions as well. What emerged from this was a pattern drawing on orthodoxy and dissent. It resulted in varying numbers of sects in Indian religions and in juxtaposition. Religions tended not to be viewed as single, uniform and monolithic. The individual identity was with the sect and the sects had recognizable differences of belief and practice. Christianity and Islam took the range from Syrian Christians to Protestants or from Sunnis to Khojas and included distinctions extending to social regulations. In the second millennium AD, there was again an occasional but distinctly important expression, not of secular ideas, but perhaps hinting at them. The teaching of a few bhakti sants, such as Kabir, Dadu, and more especially Ravidas, encouraged this. An impassioned plea suffuses the compositions of Ravidas in his vision of the city of the future that he called Behampura, the city without sorrow. Social equality among all, among all those who lived in such a city, ensured the absence of sorrow. They did not observe the social code of caste as stated in the Dharma Shastra or that of any religion. This introduces two other aspects of secularism, uh, which we have to keep in mind uh, in our concerns for today. For, for our times. The first is that caste distinctions cannot be supported in a truly secular society. Following from this is the requirement that there be equal rights and social equality for every citizen. This is the logic of secularism in relation to democracy. Some will doubtless dismiss this as impossible but we can at least make a start. And social divisions are bound to be, but it would help if they originate from more rational thinking than did caste. Making caste irrelevant is important to creating a secular society since it is tied to religion. Whether evolving within the subcontinent or outside its boundaries, religions in India have endorsed caste rather than disestablishing it. The origins of caste lie in socioeconomic patterns, but religion is an agency of its legitimation. It is particularly applicable with specific regulations in matters of kinship, as well as in particular occupations. All humans may be equal in the eyes of Allah or of God, but not in the eyes of those worshipping them on earth. The major distinction between those of caste, the Varnas, and those without caste, the Avarnas, was accepted by virtually all the religions. 
and the latter was demarcated with special names for them. Rabigas was objecting to the innate inequality of caste. The turn to the secular requires not the denial of religion as a legitimate belief system, but the autonomy of civil institutions from religious control. This means a substantial change for institutions currently under degrees of religious control. It means going beyond defining secularism as merely the coexistence of all religions, as we often do define it in India, but to recognizing it as meaning the equality of all religions and their practitioners. This means the dismissal of the existence of majority and minority communities identified by religion. Secularism is one of the ways of endorsing the rights of the citizen. It is not an imposed ideology. Let me return to the institution that I mentioned earlier. Education should not conform to religious concerns in determining its content and structure. State financed education does not require religious affiliations. The content of education is better left to the professionals in each discipline and involving discussion and debate. State run institutions should be free of religious interventions. We allow religion to give legitimacy to politics and political activity, although the two should be kept quite separate. Is it really necessary to break down a Mughal period mosque and that to a protected monument for obvious political reasons and then claim that the act carried religious sanction. A few sensitive religious practitioners did ask whether religion should be used to legitimize social disruption of this scale. In destroying a protected monument, no longer a punishable offense nowadays, um, is destroying a protected monument no longer a punishable offense, or is the law now expendable. Organized groups of Hindus were doing just what they accuse Muslim invaders and rulers of doing, destroying a place of worship. Imitation, they say, is sometimes a form of flattery. Using violence against people because of their dietary preferences regulated by religion, or preventing marriages because of differing religions, uh, these surely were once punishable offenses. In a multi-religious nation state, the laws of citizenship cannot be determined by the religious practices of only one religion. They have to be viewed in the context of the requirements of civil law cutting across all religions. Crucial to these changes is the coming of citizenship and, more importantly, its definition. The change takes place when kingdoms give way to nation states. The people are no longer the subjects, the praja, of the kingdom, but are the citizens of the new and altogether different nation state. The governing authority has to recognize the necessary change in its relationship with the citizen and is a change which is different uh, from that with the subject. This involves mutual rights, duties and obligations. Authority and control no longer vest in a monarchy but are replaced by democracy, those governing being the representatives of the people and therefore responsible to civil society. In a democratic nation state, every citizen has equal rights 
and there can be no discrimination on the basis of religion or any other qualifier. India was such a democracy just after independence. The rights of the citizens were clearly stated in the constitution, but I think they repeatedly need to be uh, reiterated to remind ourselves of these rights. They were the fundamental human rights, access to food, water and shelter, to employment, to education and health care, and also importantly, to social equality, social justice, and the freedom of expression. The Constitution requires that the state honor these rights of every citizen. And the good citizen expects the state to do so if the state is a secular democracy. It also requires the state to commit to a transparent financial outlay on meeting the expenses of such a program. The state has to be truly sensitive about human priorities since the citizen is, after all, a human being. It may be amusing to boast about our having the tallest something or the fastest something else or even space travel to Mars for vacations. But all this must wait. Guaranteeing these rights of citizenship will mean that the income of the state has to be realigned in a transparent manner to finance these rights. If this sounds like supporting a socialistic pattern of society, as in the early days of independence we did, then so be it. Once this is done, then the citizens can argue about how to manage the superstructure. Would any political party today consider this as a commitment to the citizen? Let me reiterate, <clears throat> sorry, let me reiterate that the equality of every citizen before the law, irrespective of the religion caste or status of the citizen is crucial. These days it is conveniently overlooked or sometimes even contested. Religion in itself is not what secularism objects to. The secularist is not an atheist. What is being argued for is that religion should not determine the social organization of society, its governance and its laws. This is not an opposition between religion and the secular, but a separation where each exists, but in different areas of thought and activity, and ultimately in a civil society with a difference of emphasis. Democracy requires that political parties should also be distanced from religion. In maintaining the facade of a distance, there is often an attempt to construct a new sect. And this is done in such a way that it allows a religion to be used politically. A clear example of this is Hindutva. Its ideology draws from the colonial construction of the Indian past. This was described as that of two nations, the Hindu and the Muslim, constantly in conflict. Hinduism was constructed as a single uniform monolithic religion, and in this form, rather than its pluralistic form of multiple sects, it effectively serves the requirements of religious nationalism. I have elsewhere labeled it as syndicated Hinduism, specially created in the 1930s to serve the political ideology of Hindu nationalism, whose end purpose is to bring about a Hindu Raj. Further, it imitates aspects of the Semitic religions in its attempt to provide a uniform canon or a set of such beliefs, even if this concept 
was unfamiliar to pre-modern practicing Hindus. The idea of articulating the religion through multiple sects is set aside. Its intention is to convert the Hindu into the single entity that can then be called upon to support the concept of the Hindu Rasht. Fundamental to its definition of the Hindu is that such a person and his ancestors should have been born within the boundaries of India, the Pitri Bhumi, and that this should also be the location of the origins of his religion, the Punya Bhumi. Neither of these are mentioned as essential requirements in the founding texts of Hinduism. Hindutva, Hindutva, therefore, is not the essence of Hinduism. The two are different, as is their purpose. It may be possible to argue that precisely because monolithic uniform religions do not dominate our landscape, we shall have to think of a variety of ways in which to nurture the secular, as this is now a fundamental requirement of the Indian citizen. This is where perhaps we can seek help from a well-reasoned study of our past. It will not provide models for secularizing society, but we could learn from the interface of many cultures as to how we have evolved. And that will provide us with a more credible identity than the one we are trying to establish by negating large parts of our history. This, in turn, will make us understand the necessity of both secularism and democracy. And crucial to this understanding is also the recognition of the change from the status of subject to that of citizen, together with its rights, and also that which is required to protect the Indian citizen. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thakur. May I now request Professor Irfan Habib to speak? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. It's a real privilege to be asked to participate in a function or in a program of lectures in honor of Professor Ken Panikkar in anticipation of his 75th birthday. I feel particularly privileged that I should be in company here with Professor Romila Thapar, who is recognized as the Dean of Indian Historians, with Professor Prabhat Patnaik, the leader, thinker of in the field of political economy, and Professor Rajiv Bhargu, along with, of course, Professor Villathad, who had introduced us, and you, Mr. Chen. I thought that since Professor Panikar's field was modern Indian history, and particularly aspects of the national movement and of communalism and the opposition to communalism, I should be speaking on the ideological heritage of the Indian national movement. I recognize also that today, just now, we are going through the, the centenary, of the 100th year of the Mapla Rebellion of Malabar, on which Professor Panika wrote his, one of his major works against Lord and the state. That rebellion represented an ideology which cannot be called 
political or democratic. The characteristic present reactionary ideology. So this was a present revolt all the same. And it is for and it was an anti-colonial regime all the same. So despite some of its brutalities, as in the case of 1857, we all recognize this revolt has to be given its due place in our history. And Professor Panikar has to be congratulated to have been one among those historians who have taken a very objective view of the Mapla revolt. I would go further, I would go far, forward from here and actually like to present as briefly as I can the ideological trends in the national movement which developed across time and which are sacred heritage. I would like to say beforehand that my object is a the given one, and that is to show that the national heritage, the national movement, whose intellectual and ideological development has given us exactly the kind of democratic and secular ideology that is needed today for the Indian state, particularly in a situation where both reason and secularism are under attack. I would like to begin with the intellectual movement that actually gave rise to our national movement and the establishment of the Congress, Indian National Congress in 1885, which gave us the major political party around which the national movement was evolved. This was not a patriotic uh, call to arms, but an economic study of the British colonial exploitation of India which was first developed by Dada Bhai Noroji, the old man of the Indian National Movement, the father of the Indian National Movement. In his writings from 1860s and 70s onwards, ending particularly with poverty and British rule in India in the beginning of the 19th century, or the 20th century. Um, These, he and his colleagues, like R.C. Bhatt, for instance, argued that India was being exploited by Britain. And therefore, the necessary deduction was that if India was to free itself of exploitation, it should free itself of British rule. <coughs> they themselves did not draw this necessary conclusion. But it was left to others to try it. And that is why Jawaharlal Nehru called their thoughts revolutionary. And Dipen Chandra gave the name of economic nationalism to it. From here, the major concern of the national movement, the poverty of India, actually leads one ultimately to what Professor Thakur described socially and therefore this is the first part of our heritage international ideological heritage of the national movement that we should today particularly celebrate i then pass on to the next generation which uh, i suppose gandhiji represented and take up his book, Hind Swaraj, written in and there when he was sailing from England to South Africa in the Atlantic in 1909. My taking up Hind Swaraj is 
may be regarded as a kind of petty mischief because I would be more concerned with his shortcomings uh, which Gandhiji himself actually the part deviated from in his later writings. In Swaraj assumes that India had a perfect past. Everyone, it had a, in a it had no its caste system really created a an established division of labor which dispensed with machinery. All the religions worked happily together. And the best thing that could happen to India would be to abolish machinery, to dispense with railways, to abolish modern medicine, and entrust entire teaching to Pandit Smallvis and Parsi Dastus. No social reform would be envisaged. Poverty was to be celebrated rather than alleviated. This was Gandhi in 1909. I acknowledge the virtues of Insuran. All religions were to be treated equally. And Gandhiji went out of his way to say that the Hindu opposition to concessions given to Muslims in the 1909 reform was wrong and that if Muslims were given such benefits, why should you protest if your brothers are favored? Um, and therefore, the strong you know, strength of religious unity or unity among religious communities is certainly to be celebrated and to be held for today uh, when we have an onslaught of um, the majoritarians. But clearly, the ideas of Insuraj in other respects could not be sustained. Caste system could not just be, uh, dis uh, ju just be set on one side as if it did not exist. And therefore, when Gandhiji came back to India in 1915 and began to participate in the national movement, untouchability was almost the very first thing he had to oppose in his ashram. And from that time onward, from 1915, he made little concessions as far as untouchability was concerned. And his attitude towards, became, towards it became radical and more radical until you come to the period after the Puna Pact. Another aspect of Hinswaraj, which I would say was distorted within it, but Gandhiji later on corrected it, was not that you should celebrate poverty, but that poverty should be alleviated. This is a very important difference between the two. And I think it is from the Champaran Satyagraha that Gandhiji abandoned this very important element of Hinswaraj that poverty needs to be celebrated and not alleviated. Because helping the poor was what the Champaran Satyagraha was about. They may be peasants against plantation plant planters, but they were poor against the rich. Gandhiji may go on saying that landlords and capitalists should be trustees, but actually in practice, he was never able to put forward any practical proposal, any practical proposal to ensure that they really functioned as trustees. And from Karachi resolution of 1931 onwards, he surrendered ground, practical ground, as far as steps against landlords were present, at least against the landlords were concerned, rent control, and 
restrain constraints, increasing constraints on the neurons. There were other aspects also in which Gandhian thought has lessons for us. Of course, from Hinsaraj onwards, he particularly believed in the unity of all religious communities. And that led him to support the Khilafat movement among, uh, in 1919 21. It actually it was as a part of the Khilafat movement that the Mapla revolt broke up. He also, he made no concessions in this respect. He would accept all religions, although of course saying that he was a Hindu, but he accept, he insisted on the truth of all religions. I shall come back to this point later, particularly when I come to partition, but at the moment I would shift to the other ideological trends in the national movement of which we are heirs to. One, as Professor Romala Thapar mentioned, was socialism. Socialism came, us, came to us really after the October Revolution in Russia in 1917. Although there were some, some revolutions about India past in the international working class, the second international before World War I. But the call for colonial independence of colonies issued from Russia after 1917 found sympathetic listeners in all colonial countries, but particularly in India. M. N. Roy despite his later defection to servitude to win or later deserting to the British control during World War II, was an important messenger of the communist or Marxist message to the Indian national movement. And then we had Bhagat Singh the great martyr who turned totally to Marxism and in, insisted that the national movement should lead to a kind of liberation of the Indian poor. The, that the very fact that in his last days, he should write, Why I am an atheist, shows the strong will of the man, but also his very practical nature, in which, for him, under uh, which, for instance, he justified compromise rather than incessant revolutionary action all the time. Bhagat Singh's writings, therefore, also form a very important part of the national intellectual heritage. And then we had Jawaharlal Nehru. In two books, um, Glimpses of World History, which he wrote in 1930-32, an autobiography, which he wrote in 1934-35, Jawaharlal Nehru presented what I would say a very rational presentation of the main objectives of the national movement. In tr a true sense, he was secular, because secularism means the rejection of any, re any action that is directed from a religious or spiritual point of view. Secular means, secularism means that all your action should be towards happiness in this world and not for what you would receive in the next, according to your beliefs. Secularism means worldliness. And that is what Nehru was about. Nehru frankly found Gandhiji's fondness for religions 
It is not a very attractive aspect of Gandhi. <coughs> and he praised Akbar for being for being called a man of reason rather than a man of God. It is therefore important to realize that when Indian people voted in 1937 overwhelmingly from the Congress, the main trooper for the Congress, the main speaker for the Congress, who perhaps addressed crores of audiences, was the Vahla Nehru. And that over to about two dozen businessmen issued a pamphlet against him for being a socialist and for being demanding that industry businessmen were ruining India. In other words, the Indian electorate, 15 percent of the entire population at that time, still a small electorate, but still 15 percent did vote in a majority for a program that they thought was socialist. I would finally come to Gandhiji's last days. <coughs> to me it seems that between 1945 47, despite his insistence that Hind Swaraj was still his major text, Gandhiji had abandoned practically everything reactionary in Hind Swaraj. For instance, position, attitude about women, a very important element in of, in terms of ideological heritage from the national movement. In the in the Hind Swaraj, he thought that the demand for vote for women was uncalled for. Women should stay at home. Women should not go out for work. By 1945, he was holding that women should do everything. They should have every right. Before he was opposed, opposed to intercaste marriage. Now he said he would only greet intercaste marriage, especially if there is a Haridjan member in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in that marriage. He would not give any concession to any religious prejudice. And as in his famous uh, statement, the poorest of the poor and their interests were to overrule everything else. Finally, it is his, which is particularly important for us to invoke today. When in his prayer meetings, there was an uproar when the Quran was being recited, he decided not to have any religious text recited, not a single religious text, if the Quran could not be recited. When Patel said sword must be met by sword, Gandhi openly protested. And of course, as Ram Batten said, he was a one man army when slaughter and ethnic cleansing became the law of the land, especially in what is now what is now Punjab and Haryana and Jammu and Northwest Frontier. In Delhi, he single-handedly went on fast and opposed the slaughter. As against these ideas, there were the communists whose basic interests were supporting in a directly British imperialism. 
and colonials. They cannot be regarded as patriots by under any kind of measure. When is Savarkar arrested in 1910, the nationalist activity, he gave three apologies. He promised support for the British government that he had learned his lesson. And therefore, he was released under conditions. And under those restrictions, when he could not say anything against the British, he wrote in Dutva, which is now the major doctrine of what is called Indian nationalism, or what I would call official nationalism. In 1938, when the Congress at T.N. Munshi's bidding released him, the first thing he did was to denounce the Congress and the national movement. He presented the two-nation theory two years, two years or three years before, two years before the Lahore Revolution. And Golwalkar soon put it in his ideas as he himself acknowledged in we or our nationhood defined, in which he has said that all non-Hindus, that of course meaning Muslims, shall be wholly subordinate to the Hindu nation, claiming nothing, not even citizens' rights. This has not been disowned by the RSS or BJP till today. On the Muslim side, Iqbal had raised the matter of Muslim nationhood in 1930, but in a very cavalier manner, and which he soon later on disowned, which has now been printed, his letters have been printed. The Muslim League Rahor Revolution came in 1940, two years after Gol, two years after both Savarkar and Golwalkar had spoken on two nations. And therefore, one must recognize who was the opponent of the national movement. The entire idea, idea, ideas developed by the national that through in the national movement are our sacred heritage. And Hindutva cannot claim to have been a part of our national movement. What did Kolwalkar do against the British? What would do Savarkar do against the British after 1923? What writing did he publish? What did Kolwalkar say against the British in his We or Our Nation Who Defined? Show me that piece. The Muslim League's main opponent remained the Indian National Congress. It hardly ever put any invective against the British government. So one must recognize that the communists had no role in the national movement. And we must today therefore go back to the to our heritage, the intellectual heritage that the national movement has left behind. Professor Panikar, Panikar's writings have done exactly that. He has throughout his writings relied on the best intellectual elements of our national movement, has incivilized them, and has throughout made no concession to communism in any of its aspects. Therefore, today we should celebrate Professor Panikar's writings, Professor Panikar's achievements, and Professor Panikar as a person. Thank you. on the next session. Over to Professor Michael Paragon. Uh, thank you, Professor Rajan Gurukal. Uh, Professor Prapad Patnaik, Rajiv Bhargava, Romila Papa, Irfan Habib, 
all who are linked virtually with this gathering and discussion. And last but not least, Professor Ken Panika. We have assembled for a session of lectures in honor of Ken Panika. And this session would include two presentations by Professor Prabhat Patnaik and Professor Rajiv Bhargava. Panika's academic and intellectual contributions are certainly multifaceted. Therefore, to attempt to contain them all in a single title for a seminar, the organizers had to struggle a lot. The title chosen, India, Secularism, Democracy, and Socialism, just about covers the lot. He not only took classes on this subject and wrote books and treatises, guided students in these areas, but also actively worked from the front for fighting for these principles as well. I need not elaborate on these matters to a gathering of this sort, because I'm sure many of you would have already walked a long distance with him in his arduous path. Along with this pedagogic achievements. Uh, he is also known well for building up appropriate institutions for the future India. This state, Kerala, has benefited from his efforts, particularly. And the Kerala State Council for Higher Education and the Kerala Council for Historical Research are two of the brilliant examples of Panikas institution building efforts. All these are to be remembered and analyzed together by this August gathering, was to be engaged by the presentations by Professor Prabhat Patnaik and Professor Rajiv Bhargava. So let me invite Dr. Rajan Varghese to formally introduce the speakers of this session. Professor Rajan Varghese. Okay, good evening. Uh, the distinguished speakers on the team in this session are Professor Prakat Patnaik and Professor Rajiv Bhargava. Professor Prakat Patnaik of JNU needs no introduction to the academic community in Kerala. Well-known Indian economist, Professor Patnaik, as the Vice Chairman of the Kerala State Planning Board. And currently, he is a member of the advisory body of the Kerala State Higher Education Council. Professor Rajiv Pardava is a political theorist as Professor of Political Theory at JNU. His works on political theory, multiculturalism, secularism, how to he worked sharp debates. Currently, he is associated with the Center for Study of Developing Societies, New Delhi. <coughs> Professor Prakar Patnaik and Professor Rajiv Parvoa have close academic association with Professor Ken Panikin. I welcome Professor Prakar Patnaik and Professor Rajiv Parvoa to this meeting. In this segment, uh, in this meeting, there is a segment called Reflections, Professor G. Arnima and Professor K. M. Shiva will be speaking on in this session. Professor Arnima was professor at the Center for Women Studies School of Social Science, JNU, before taking charge as director of KCHR. And Dr. Shiva K. M. is currently professor at the Sri Shankarajariya University of Sanskrit, Kaladi. She was a student of Professor Panikar for her PhD program at JNU. 
I welcome all the speakers to this session. Thank you. Uh, Professor Prabhat Patnaik. Uh, Professor Prabhat Patnaik. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, yeah. I'm very grateful for this opportunity which is given to me to pay my respects to my old friend, Professor K. N. Panikar, who has not only been an outstanding historian, but above all, an outstanding public intellectual fighting against the communal forces. He has been a pillar of strength for me and several others in these very difficult times. Romila in her speech brought out the connections between democracy, secularism, and socialism, that the three are not three separate things, but are in fact interrelated, that you cannot have democracy without secularism, you cannot have democracy and secularism without socialism or a socialistic pattern of society as the objective towards which we all strive. What I would like to say is that the anti-colonial national movement in India actually enshrined all these three. There is a strong misconception among many, particularly Western scholars, who believe that nationalism is a homogeneous category and somehow, on the whole, an undesirable category. What this fails to see is the distinction between nationalism in Europe and nationalism in third world countries, which really grew and took shape during the anti-colonial struggle. There were at least three very important distinctions between the post-Westphalian nationalism that developed in Europe and, of course, the nationalism of the anti-colonial struggle in countries like India, Tanzania, Ghana, and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, the first is that the European nationalism privileged the nation over the people, something which you find, for instance, in Eric Maria remarks, All Quiet on the Western Front, that basically the people were supposed to make sacrifices for this entity called the nation, which was super, which, which, which was above them. The nation did very precious little for the people, but the people were asked to make sacrifices for the nation. Secondly, that nationalism always had an enemy within whether it is the Catholics in Northern Europe, whether it is the Protestants in Southern Europe, the Jews everywhere, there was always an enemy within, while the anti-colonial nationalism was one that actually had a, a, a complete kind of, you know, I mean, it, it was personal. Everybody who was resident of the nation was a part of the nation. And the third feature is that European nationalism from the very beginning was imperialist. It was imperialist in the sense that within a very short period of the Westphalian peace treaties, which actually began as it were European nationalism and talk of the nation, Cromwell had marched into Ireland in order to conquer Ireland in the first imperialist venture in human in modern human history so uh, again you find that anti-colonial nationalism or anti-imperialist nationalism far from being imperialist was actually anti-imperialist 
Therefore, the three hallmarks of anti-imperialist nationalism, democracy, secularism, and socialism were interrelated. They were part, as I said, of the anti-colonial national struggle. And what is more, they duly constituted the foundation uh, for the Indian constitution. They were the foundational values of the Indian constitution. Now, the question, the, the, the question which, which immediately arises as, as far as uh, people of my generation or, or, or anybody is that while the India in which I was born, the India in which I grew up, apart from a very brief period of the emergency, this very brief period when democratic rights were suppressed, on the whole, remain loyal at least to the vision of that anti-colonial nationalism, anti-imperialist nationalism, and remained on the whole loyal to the ideas of democracy, secularism, and some kind of socialism. When I say socialism, I don't mean communism. I don't mean Soviet socialism. There was socialistic pattern of society that, that Jawaharlal Nehru talked about. There was the Nyerere socialism. There was Nkrumah socialism. There were different kinds of socialism, but there was a broad common understanding that we cannot remain loyal to the promises of the anti-imperialist struggle if we have a straightforward capitalist pattern of development, if we have straightforward capitalist development, because capitalism by its very nature breeds massive inequalities, and these inequalities are incompatible with democracy and they're incompatible with building a secular democratic society. Now, how is it that while for a very long period of time, we actually had loyalty to these founding principles of our nation, how is it that today we find that we are in a completely different world? Today, democracy is being throttled. Democracy, Walter Bejo had, had, had defined democracy as government by discussion. Far from there being discussion, you actually have a situation where, uh, uh, you know, what I say must be right. If you don't agree with me, then you're anti-national. This is the kind of logic that is being applied to incarcerate lots and lots of activists who don't agree with the supreme leader. Uh, secondly, you find obviously secularism given the go by. Uh, there is not just in terms of prejudices and hatred which are being evoked, but even in terms of a legal discrimination, which is, for instance, incorporated into the CAA. And of course, we know that socialism is now a dirty word. The capitalists are supposed to be the wealth creators. And what is more, public sector enterprises are being handed over to the capitalists, which is a very antithesis of any kind of a socialist project. So, so how is it that even though the country remained loyal for a very long time to the ideas of democracy, socialism, and secularism, today we find just the opposite to be the case. I think it's, it, it's an important question for me. It has, it has worried me quite a lot. And I would place the, 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 the change, I would place the climacteric in the 1980s. A very simple index of this is the following, that if you look at some estimates, which are done by the French economist Thomas Piketty, Thomas Piketty looks at the share of the total national income going to the top 1% of the population. And he finds, and he uses income tax data, income tax was introduced in India in 1922. So he 
data from 1922 onwards. And on the basis of it, he makes calculations which show that the share of the top 1% of the population in national income, which was roughly around 21 plus percent in 1922, declined to 6% in 1982, after which it started rising. And today, of course, is the highest that, that it has ever been which is about, again, 22%, which exceeds the level where it was in 1922, when we had Maharajas and, 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 and such like people. Therefore, you find that somewhere in the 1980s, this is just a very crude index, but somewhere in the 1980s, something happened. And what happened? I believe that in the capitalist world, mind you, what has happened is not just confined to India. It is an international phenomenon. And I believe that somewhere in the capitalist world, a major shift took place, a, a, a fundamental structural shift took place. And that shift was of the kind where, for the first time, capital became genuinely global. By genuinely global, what I mean is that earlier, for instance, capital moved around the world, but the point is that it moved, let's say, within the metropolitan countries. It moved from Britain to the United States, from Britain to Canada, from Britain to continental Europe, and so on. Uh, but it didn't really come to the third world country. It didn't come to the colonies, except to plantations, to mines, and such like, which actually refurbished the colonial pattern of international division of labor. But capital never came to the colonies in order to take advantage of the cheap labor prevailing here, which itself was a product of deindustrialization and the drain of the colonial period, in order to set up factories and plants, which would then export internationally to meet global demand. Capital never did that. Capital only moved as dictated by the colonial pattern of international division of labor, where the companies or the third world generally produced primary commodities, uh, and the first world produced manufactured goods and, 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 and processed goods. Now, therefore, what you had was really very limited mobility of capital, certainly no cross north south mobility of capital. For the first time, what you have now is really globalization of capital flows and above all globalization of finance capital flows. Now, this has an obvious implication. If you have finance that is globalized, but the states continue to be nation states, which is a contrast from what had happened earlier. Earlier, you had national capital labor nationally organized and the nation state presiding over it, whether it's Britain or France or Germany or, or, in, or, or, or India after independence. But the point is that, that, that now what you have is that labor is, of course, nationally organized. You have a nation state, but capital is globalized. Now, if you have globalized capital, but you have a nation state, then, of course, if the nation state does anything which is not to the liking of globalized capital, which, by the way, in, includes the capital originating in the country itself, if the nation state does something which is not to the liking of capital, capital leaves the nation. And this is particularly true of finance, which is highly mobile, which can leave the nation at the drop of a hat and uh, at, at, at one telephone call and bring about an enormous financial crisis for the country in question. I'll just give you one example of an advanced country. When John Bezier was the Prime Minister of Britain, overnight, suddenly, they on the And because of that, John Bezier had to borrow massively in the European market in order to sustain the pound. In other words, even in as strong an economy as Britain, the currency could be destabilized, a financial crisis precipitated, 
only at the drop of a hat and the country is 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 is, is sort of you know stares at economic ruin unless it is the case that something can be done in order to placate the uh, globalization uh, the, the 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 globalized finance capital therefore when the nation state faces globalized finance the nation state has to kowtow to the dictates of globalized finance it has to more or less pursue the kinds of policies that globalized finance would want it to policy to 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 pursue and these are roughly the policies that we all refer to as the neoliberal policies as long as you remain confined within the structure of a of 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 globalization no matter what your political views you would be forced to pursue the same kinds of policies tomorrow for instance in india even if you have a maoist government as long as the maoists remain within this globalization if they do then they too would be pursuing more or less the same policies which earlier governments have been pursuing because these policies are pursued by earlier governments not out of their own volition but because they are actually dictated by globalized finance and globalized capital generally by the way one aspect of these policies is the encroachment on petty production and peasant agriculture whose fallout in terms of the peasant movement we are seeing today we who, whose fallout in terms of the peasant movement in terms of resistance we are seeing today and this again is something which is essentially uh, uh, backed by globalized finance and globalized capital now this therefore once this change takes place a number of things you know i mean the old paradigm then is gradually abandoned one reason for this abandonment of course is the fact that uh, you know production growth gdp has always been an important obsession with most people and an important marker of modernity marx talked about the capitalist economy in fact in in in, in the preface to capital he talks about the laws of motion of modern society using the term modern society as synonymous with the capitalist mode of production Adam Smith called his book an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations implying somewhere that promoting the wealth of nations is really a, a, a task that a modern nation must be addressing itself to also there has always been there has always been an a certain fascination a, a certain uh, subscribing if you like to the idea that in a country which is developing which is modernizing itself we must have a high growth rate and which is why also the earlier dirigist regime which had remained loyal to the old values of the anti colonial struggle and so on, you know which had remained if not fully loyal at least largely loyal to the anti colonial struggle and so on Uh, was sneeringly referred to as the Hindu rate of growth, basically that a rate of growth that, that that's too small, and East Asian countries were really held up as as examples and so on. But in the 1980s, with globalization of capital and capital willing to flow into countries like India, flowing into China, flowing into other third world countries, and accelerating their growth rates, you actually found that this. fascination for higher growth rate fascination for gdp and so on is something that actually now has a chance to realize itself and that is why you have an unraveling of the old regis regime and an acceptance and adoption of a neoliberal regime now neoliberal regime obviously is one which in a very fundamental sense is antithetical to democracy why because democracy implies that the electorate exercises a choice it exercises the choice between different political parties which have their own uh, economic programs 
and of course, uh, whatever. Therefore, people choose their own economic destinies by voting for this or that party whose program they find attractive at that particular point. But on the other hand, if you have a country in which no matter who you vote for, more or less the same economic program is going to be adopted, then of course, the choice of the people becomes irrelevant. Then of course, at least in the realm of the economy, there isn't much to choose between A and B and C. And this itself is an attenuation of democracy. This itself is a constriction of democracy. But while it is a constriction of democracy, it is still a long way from neo-fascism of the kind that we see today. How is it that we got to this particular point? I believe that what has happened is that not only is it the case that we have been sucked into a neoliberal regime, but that the neoliberal regime itself is facing a very serious terminal crisis. I would not have time to go into why this crisis, but fundamentally, the neoliberal regime is facing a terminal crisis. After 2008, there has been huge unemployment all over the capitalist world, and the symptoms of this crisis are really pretty clear. Even in the advanced capitalist countries, you find that large unemployment exists, unemployment whose, I mean, ignoring which is also pushing those countries towards neo-fascist movements of one kind or another. In fact, John Maynard Keynes had once said that the world would not tolerate for long the kinds of unemployment, that capital, the, 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 the levels of unemployment, that capitalism, except in brief periods of excitement, really engenders. As a matter of fact, those brief periods of excitement in which capitalist booms occur have disappeared, and now we are in a prolonged crisis of large unemployment and so on. And as we know, all periods of crisis, particularly all periods of large scale unemployment, are conducive to the growth of fascism. This is exactly what had happened in 1930s, and this is exactly the kind of thing which is happening today. These are periods in which, because monopoly capital, domestic monopoly capital, which is aligned to this globalized finance capital, because monopoly capital finds that is earlier ways of supporting itself, earlier ways of, of making itself legitimate no longer work. Why? Because earlier, what was the idea? The idea was, oh, look at this very high growth rate we're having. If we're having this very high growth rate, which India did have earlier this century, then sooner or later, this is going to trickle down to everybody. So just wait your turn. Today you're unemployed, today you're poor, but you just wait your turn. We're having 8% growth rate. Sooner or later, you are also going to be a beneficiary of this growth rate. Now, that disappears the moment the growth rate disappears. As a result, you find that neoliberalism needs some additional prop. The domestic corporates need some additional prop to sustain themselves. And one such additional prop which they use is, of course, Hindutva. You see, groups like the Hindutva group and, and so on, I mean, they, they, they are there in every society. Every society has uh, the neo-fascist elements, but they remain on the fringes normally. But they come to the center stage when they're adopted by corporate capital and financed by corporate capital, and thereby they actually acquire a kind of centrality. And this is precisely what happened in a period of crisis. So what we have today is a corporate Hindutva alliance, which has brought neo-fascists who are financed by corporate capital to power in order to bolster corporate capital to carry out its agenda in a period in which this agenda is threatened by possible revolt from below. Now, the question which immediately arises is that, okay, if this is the case, then what about bringing back to the forefront the kind of agenda which the anti-colonial nationalism had put be before the nation, the, the agenda of the anti-colonial struggle. Is it the case that that agenda is gone for good? On the contrary, what I would argue is that the very 
fact that neoliberalism is facing a terminal crisis. You see, there is a big difference between fascism of the 1930s and neo-fascism of today. And that difference consists that in a period, say it came to in 1933, between 1933 and 1939, Hitler carried out a program of mass rearmament in Germany, financed by government borrowing, which means a fiscal deficit, because of which unemployment was eliminated in Germany. In Japan, Japan was the first country to eliminate the unemployment of the Great Depression in 1931. As early as 1931, again, for the same reason, they carried out a program of rearmament financed by government borrowing. But the problem is that today, since this neo-fascism comes to power in countries where if it enlarges the fiscal deficit, in that case, localist finance would not like. I mean, obviously, one way that the government can eliminate the kinds of unemployment and crisis that, 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 that exists today is by enlarging government expenditure, financed either by government borrowing, which means a fiscal deficit, or by taxes on capitalists. If the government taxes workers to finance larger expenditure, then it doesn't add to demand because the workers more or less consume everything they earn. So if you take 100 rupees away from them, their consumption falls by 100 rupees. And when the government spends these 100 rupees, there's no net increase in demand. Net increase in demand would only arise if the government taxes either the capitalists or it actually doesn't tax anybody, simply borrows, which basically prints currency notes or whatever. So in such a case, the, but you see, Globalized finance, obviously, or, or no corporate capital in any country would like being taxed, they would oppose it. And likewise, fiscal, fiscal deficit is something that globalized finance does not like because it undermines the social legitimacy of capitalism. Capitalism would like to present before the people that it is not the government that is actually required for overcoming the crisis of capitalism. In fact, one of their greatest venoms is against the public sector. The whole idea is to show the public sector can't work. If you want entities to work, if you want enterprises to work, it's entrusted to us. Therefore, there is no way that contemporary capitalism can overcome the crisis which neoliberalism has been uh, thrown into. And that being the case, contemporary neo-fascism can, of course, be ruthless. It can subvert democracy. It can subvert secularism, but only for a brief while, because they simply lack the wherewithal in order to acquire the kind of legitimacy that they would otherwise acquire if they also had some kind of a credible economic program. They are not, they are incapable of producing any solution to the people's requirements, to the people's distress and so on, even a fascistic solution to people's distress, because of which their days are necessarily numbered. The fact that in this situation we are having the peasants, the Kisans, who have risen against them, and risen so valiantly, taking them on, this is really the first major challenge to them. And such challenges are going to grow over time until we actually get rid of, of, of this lot. And when we do, then of course we can rework the agenda of the freedom struggle. In, this, in reworking this agenda, the kind of thing that Romila was talking about, introducing a set of rights, and I would say a set of economic rights, would become a very important component. And those economic rights can be easily introduced, they can be easily financed in this country through a system of wealth taxes. I made a calculation where if you simply tax through a wealth tax, just two taxes, one is a 2% wealth tax of the top 1%, of the population. The other is a one-third inheritance tax, again on the top 1% of the population, when you can actually finance five fundamental economic rights, the right to food, the right to employment, 
the right to quality healthcare, the right to quality education, and the right to old age pension and disability benefits amounting to 3,000 rupees per month per, per old person. Therefore, India can be made a welfare state if it is the case that we can actually have a system of wealth taxation, nothing is difficult, and therefore this agenda has uh, uh, great possibilities and we have to revive that agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Patnaik. Um, can I invite Professor Rajiv Bhagava uh, to speak? Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, Thank you. I'm uh, deeply privileged to be part of this event with such eminent speakers, honoring uh, my friend and uh, former colleague, Professor Ken Panika. Uh, as everybody has said, he's, he's a person we've all looked up to. He's an outstanding historian, uh, a, a, an excellent institution builder, and uh, and a powerful public intellectual uh, c qualities that one rarely sees uh, together in one person, but we see it in him. So I'm, I'm really, really delighted that I'm part of, uh, of this event. So what I'm gonna do is to actually give you two lectures. One is very, very short, and that is on secularism. And here I speak as a, as a participant come observer, I believe I'm, some kind of an activist as well uh, in this uh, 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 on this uh, issue, and uh, uh, and and this is what I have to say uh, from my own experience and from my study uh, that no matter how important the protection of uh, minority rights is, and I want to underscore that that this that is this is something extremely important, secularism must not be reduced to a minority protection device. Because equally important are two other issues for secularism. First is to save all religious communities from their own bigots, from their own uh, fanatical uh, 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 practitioners, from their extremists, and from their, from their exclusivists. So, it's not just that secularism is needed by citizens who do not see themselves in religious terms. I entirely agree with Rommel on that. But even if we were to, to uh, give salience to our religious identities and see ourselves as Hindus and Muslims and Christians and so on, it's important to, 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 to uh, understand that secularism uh, stands for uh for 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 for, for their real uh, the real substance of of uh, or the real spirit of some of their uh, religious perspectives rather than uh what is made of uh, of it by the the bigots and the fanatics but more importantly secularism is also required to remove what i've called intra religious domination because there are lots of vulnerable sections within religious communities, each of each religious community, who face oppression and domination by other members of their own religious community. So Dalits, women, uh, lots of internal minorities, I'll take just one example, the Ahmadiyas uh, among Muslims, uh, they, they face uh, uh, these problems and only a secular state can address them, can resolve them. So, uh, so uh, this is all that I have to say uh, on this issue of secularism, and I end this first short lecture here. But on democracy, I think I have got some uh, longish. Uh, uh, I've got a longish presentation uh, on Indian democracy. Uh, I have some. I, I mean, th this is not an issue on which I've thought a great deal. So uh, please forgive um, the stray thoughts that I have here, but I, I, I take this opportunity to present them before you. Uh, this is more on the crisis of democracy and, and the, the deepening crisis of democracy. 
Uh, now, democracy is the kind of a kind of system which faces crisis all the time. It's not free of crisis at any time. There are always periodic bouts of the crisis of legitimation of democracy. But today's crisis is very different. It's not just about uh, you know, the standard understanding of legitimation that we had, and which I will briefly mention uh, later, but on the very idea of legitimation, on what counts as, legi as legitimation. And this, in my view, is uh, much more uh, profound and real, this crisis. Because legitimacy can be based, legitimacy of the state, legitimacy of governments, can either be based on what governments do on their actions, uh, on, on, on results and outcome. Uh, but that is not how states and governments are being legitimized today. They are legitimized by manufactured opinion. <laughs> uh, uh, and that is a matter of serious concern. Uh, so th there, as Prabhat pointed out, and I entirely agree, the, the elections today do not deal with substantive issues, certainly no substantive economic issues. Uh, and, and these elections, elections are such that they can all be, I mean, every, all sort of powerful groups uh, and those who know how to win elections have somehow figured out how to, to manage votes and how to manage these elections. And, and this, meant, this, this means uh, a hallowing out of democracy uh, which, which I think I, I want to talk uh, in, in somewhat greater detail. So uh, what follows is uh, from one point of view, uh, my point of view, uh, is a, a short story of Indian democracy, a brief history of Indian democracy. Now, we all know that <clears throat> democracy in India was introduced under very difficult conditions. Uh, it was believed uh, that democracy survives only uh, in under conditions of social equality, uh, uh, high levels of economic growth, high degree of religious and cultural uh, homogeneity, and high levels of public education. India uh, in 1950 uh, did not have any of these conditions. Uh, and therefore, almost every Western scholar had predicted uh, the quick demise of, of democracy. Yet, we flummoxed all the doomsayers. We had democracy and it existed in a reasonably good uh, uh, condition for a pretty long and uh, uh, long time. Uh, although uh, it, it had its flaws uh, and I will men and these flaws uh, uh, introduced uh, uh, this, these moments of crisis. Uh, so let's begin very early on uh, under the what Rajini Kotari called the Congress system, which flourished for the first 15 years. There were large pockets of India which were marred by unfair practices, unfair electoral practices and suppression of the votes of poor, of the poor, the, the Dalits and, and women. Uh, one could argue that uh, for, for these people, there was no real inclusion in any meaningful sense. Uh, it, it was also what the Rudolphs, uh, the political scientists, uh, the two Rudolphs called a command polity, uh, which is to say that the state was guiding and shepherding uh, the whole society. But as the Congress system gave way to a genuine, genuine multi-party system, and the separation of the of the BKU, I think it's called, uh, of of uh, uh, headed by Charan Singh, because of a great in distress and because of widely felt, generally neglect of rural India and farmers' issues, was I think the first challenge that was posed to uh, to, to 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 the to the legis to the legitimacy of existing democracy. Also, the replacement of command structure by a demand polity uh, saw multiple protest movements, which I believe eventually resulted in the imposition of the emergency, uh, which was on the one hand, a backlash against the success of democracy, and on the other ha hand, an indicator that eventually democracy was taking deeper roots because when the emergency was declared, 
we, we realize how valuable our political liberties are, our civil liberties are. And we also felt the need for strengthening uh, a fair, a system of free and fair elections. And, and, and so um, these were the two points on which there was a crisis, uh, the suppression of pro protest movements and uh, the, the suppression of political liberties on the one hand and the absence of fair and free elections. And I think uh, some of this was resolved in the late 80s. So I would say that the first crisis of democracy, the first major crisis of democracy was largely procedural in nature. And we were able to overcome this crisis. Not to, that's not to say that this crisis doesn't uh, emerge from time to time uh, even now. But I think that its first big moment, uh, I think, was was early uh, in our experience of democracy, and we were able to sort of resolve it. However, the, this crisis then gave way to another crisis, and this was a crisis of social legitimacy, because people realized that it is one thing to elect your representatives by a process of fair and free elections, and quite another to have chosen rep those representatives who really fit the bill. Uh, th these representatives, if they are truly, if they are to be true representatives of their people, must have not only the capacity to accurately mirror their interests and, and the votes of the, the, the voters, but also to deliver on their promises. And this was missing. Uh, uh, and so uh, uh, people felt, uh, felt this crisis, they, they articulated uh, their complaints and their grievances against it. And uh, many of them felt that this could be resolved if the representatives were chosen from their own group. Uh, that is to say, people who, with who they could identify, who, could, who they could call their own, who they could, and therefore who they could rely upon. And, and, and so this crisis of second, of social legitimacy was sought to be resolved by a politics of identity and with the formation of uh, separate uh, parties, OBC parties such as the Samajwadi parties and, the, and Dalit parties such as the Bahujan Samajwad, uh, Bahujan Samajwad party, as well as many regional, the strengthening of regional parties in, in Punjab, uh, in, in Maharashtra, in, in, uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu earlier and Karnataka. Yet, I think uh, uh, the legitimation crisis of democracy, you know, continued and it took another form. Now, uh, that I think was because <clears throat> those who were hitherto excluded from the political sphere, uh, these new claimants who now entered the political sphere, uh, they, uh, uh, I mean, there was a certain context in which this happened. The state's resources were already uh, scarce, and therefore competition for these resources uh, was getting more and more intensified. Uh, instead of the free and easy delivery of goods and services, resources, which in a good welfare system should, have, sh should be made available routinely to ordinary citizens, they were sold in a covert auction to the highest bidder. And this also meant an opening for an army of fixers or brokers and middlemen who took commission, who took commission from these ordinary uh, uh, people, from these potential beneficiaries. And, and, and this led uh, actually one of my colleagues uh, uh, in the, in the, at the center uh, where I've been for the last 10 years, uh, DL Shade, to say that Indian people actually do not choose their representative, they choose their middlemen. Uh, so this representational system was really quite dysfunctional. And there was another problem, which was made worse by, by uh, the scarcity of, uh, of, of state resources, and this had to do with uh, distribution of these resources. Uh, uh, there was, uh, this distribution has to be done by people who run the state, uh, that is to say politicians and, and civil servants. And, and, and therefore, there was a competition for government jobs and public offices, which uh, that competition was you know, further intensified uh, and because there were new claimants and, and because uh, 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 these claimants uh, and because uh, scarce resources were scarce. So uh, this enormously increased the cost of participating in elections. Politicians needed to finance their campaigns illegally 
with, with you know, so-called dirty money. Uh, civil servants were often in, deployed to amass illegal wealth for their political masters. Uh, money spent on elections, after all, had to be recovered one way or another, and, and the collection of this illegal side income became a necessity, uh, even as uh, it ignited insatiable greed, and politics itself became a big business. And, and this led to a, to, to a lot of abuse of public office. Uh, and and this is this is uh, now every this is something which is pretty well known uh, through the work of people like Craig Jeffries and others. Anyway, the real point at issue is that even those who were elected from a person's own group, say one's caste or one linguistic region, were invariably sucked into this bureaucratic corruption and police malfeasance, making it impossible to deliver goods and services that they yearn for. And so the politics of identity had to fail. Uh, and this led to a third crisis. Uh, this is not a procedural uh, issue. It's not, a, it's not a crisis of social legitimacy. One can say this is a crisis of moral legitimacy because there was a profound explosion of political distrust. Uh, there were popular demands that citizens have to do something about it on their own. They had to act as watchdogs. They had to monitor democracy. Uh, they must have veto power to to stop the passage of bills. Uh, there should be people's tribunals. Uh, there should be greater transparency and accountability. Uh, uh, so so uh, there were all these uh, 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 popular demands uh, of, of more active citizenry. Uh, you, might, you might remember the right to information. Uh, uh, and this is, and the, and the major anti-corruption movement, which, uh, it, it's, which uh, I hope, uh, uh, can be understood better in, in, in terms of what I've uh, uh, discussed, and so uh, we, we this is this is what was there in in 2000, 2014. I mean, a, a big you know you can say a democratic upsurge, along with a distrust of the state, uh, huge expectations which were unfulfilled, uh, distrust of conventional politics. Uh, the establishment seemed to be tainted. Uh, people seemed to be looking for something new. And there were a, a, new, uh, a new people participating, younger people getting into politics. Uh, remember the Nirbhaya movement uh, and the anti-corruption movement. There was proliferation of news channels and there were so-called citizen journalists. Uh, mobile phones were used as cameras. Uh, there were sting operations. I mean, there was a real, uh, I would say, a real uh, explosion at that time of, of uh, democratic sentiment. Uh, and, and, you know, modern political orders depend on their survival, uh, on the support and public approval and consent of the people. They are seen to be legitimate if people feel and believe and can generally experience that enough is being done by the system to deliver basic material goods and services. And when they're reasonably satisfied that those in power, those who are within the established system are doing their best to help these ordinary people uh, achieve their objectives of leading a decent and dignified life. Now, this legitimacy uh, uh, collapses when a, gas, a gap emerges uh, between or widens between what people expect and what they get. And, and, and that's exactly what had happened in 2013-14. So, uh, so there was a populist wave, uh, which was a, res a response to this crisis of moral legitimacy, which had all the features of, of, of which we associate with, with populism, uh, which is uh, uh, politics is the direct and immediate expression of popular will. Uh, the, uh, the, this will must be implemented. Uh, all norms and procedures and all institutions that obstruct it should be done away with. Uh, so there's a lot of impatience with what were believed to be tainted institutions. So, I mean, the crisis of institutions, which have been exploited now, it goes back quite a long way. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the weakening of institutions had taken place even earlier. Secondly, the, the word, the people itself was a term which was very vague, very flimsy, very uh, kind of loose, uh, and it included uh, people from all castes, classes, religions, gender, regions, and so on. And everybody, anybody who was 
who believed, simply believed that he was a victim of the political order or the political class of the established system, uh, or who was vulnerable, you know, uh, started to uh, think of uh, uh, himself or herself as part of this of this victimized people. Remember how uh, awfully, uh, how strongly people stood against uh, this VIP culture. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, you remember that. Uh, and, and finally, uh, and third, uh, there, there was very little ideology. I mean, left and right didn't seem to matter uh, uh, in, this, in, this, in this populist uh, 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 sort of uh, political uh, condition. Uh, 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 these new formations that emerged seemed to have a chameleon-like uh, feature. They could change their color. Uh, they could they could be left left looking at one time and right looking at another time uh, and 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 finally uh, it was believed that the entire society could be made up into two strong homogenous groups one of a corrupt elite and the other the, the morally pure people and 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 it's the will of these morally pure people that must be that, that must prevail. Uh, by by getting rid of or by by taming the the tainted uh, establishment. Okay, <clears throat> uh, AAP I think uh, was a classic sort of political party, uh, or, or a populist political party, uh, and the other party to exploit that was of course uh, the Modi led BJP. But before I come to that, I think I, I'll just say two things. Uh, uh, to sort of to lay the background conditions. One, I think uh, something, the momentous events of 1979, uh, I mean, all these trends go back all the way. I think we need to go there. Uh, the momentous events included A, uh, Khomeini coming to power in Iran, the militants occupying uh, the great mosque in Mecca and the Saudi, Saudi royalty striking a deal with militant extremists with Sunni militant extremists, uh, and, 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 and therefore uh, not only a radicalization, but also uh, uh, an internal polarization, a kind of a uh, intersectarian warfare developing within uh, these militant uh, 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 Islamists. Uh, don't forget that 79 was also the year when the Soviet Union invaded uh, Afghanistan and which led to the consequent rise of the American funded Taliban. Uh, and so we have the beginning of, uh, of uh, not only global political Islam, but also uh, it gave tremendous Philip to religion based politics everywhere to exclusivist religious nationalism. And to uh, it's very clear that all of this, uh, I mean, a, a, a Cold War rivalry but especially American imperial interests were, uh, were, were deeply linked with the emergence of, 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 of these uh, uh, religious-based uh, movements and religious-based uh, uh, nationalisms. But not only that, 79 was also the year when Margaret Thatcher came to power. So certain neoliberal tendencies which were beginning to shape, take shape in the early 70s, they began to consolidate themselves. And by 79, these guys had taken state, they seized state power. And that meant the birth of a conservative neoliberal backlash everywhere, including in India. Uh, and, and you see uh, uh, a new, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the elites demanding. I mean, some people have called it the revolt of the elites, elites demanding uh, uh, the rollback of a lot of what they believe were concessions, uh, concessions to the poor, concessions to uh, Dalits, uh, concessions to the minorities, and, and very slowly uh, realizing also a lot of concessions that were given to women who were now to be seen only as sources of income, but no more, and uh, who must play a more conventional role. And of course, uh, all this, uh, uh, as, as this neoliberal agenda and Prabhat has spoken about it as it sort of moved forward. There was a great a deepening of inequalities, uh, and and the 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 elites became more ruthless, less compassionate. Uh, they did not want any constraints, legal or moral, on 
on their power. Uh, the new middle class had exactly the same feeling that we should grab wealth, power, fame very quickly. They couldn't wait to move up and so on. So eventually what we had, uh, what we had at that time uh, in 2012-13 was that the, the social and economic agenda had a, already got a very strong right wing flavor. But uh, against that was uh, a political agenda, which seemed to be generally democratic. And there seemed to be some kind of a contradiction between the two. Uh, and that contradiction had to, something had to give way. And, and uh, I believe that uh, it was in the end, uh, I mean, uh, democracy had to cave in to this right wing agenda. Uh, po the, this populist could be left wing, but it didn't. It ultimately got a right wing flavor. I think op two has that flavor, but the real victor in all this was uh, was uh, the BJP Modi led BJP, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, 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 which which eventually won and which has shaped uh, Indian politics ever since in a very uh, uh, strong way. Um, I know uh, Prabhat is more optimistic. And I'm sure I would want to be as optimistic. I mean, I hope that I'm as up, no, what, but I, I, I want to be as optimistic as him, but at the moment I can't bring myself to, 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 to do so. I, I just still think that uh, the, the important thing is that Mr. Modi grabbed power, not on the basis of the Ram Janmabhumi movement, which is, is what he got as an inheritance, but on the basis of this new new uh, populist movement. But once he came to power, he uh, he he has uh, 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 mixed uh, some right wing populist elements into a much more uh, old fashioned militant religious nationalism, uh, and with uh, uh, right wing uh, neoliberal economic policies. And uh, I think Prabhat has already given us a flavor of why uh, this whole uh, 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 whole uh, kind of entity is moving in a certain direction. Uh, but I'd like to, in the last four or five minutes that I have, I'd like to spend some more time on on you know the 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 new direction that our polity is taking. Uh, because the measures that have been taken to consolidate power are very, very different. So they're very similar to some of the measures that have been taken elsewhere, but they're very different from what, uh, what measures were, uh, were undertaken uh, by Indian politicians uh, before 2014. First of all, I think the public uh, uh, domain is completely collapsed. Uh, there is no public reasoning. There are no arguments. In fact, there is no public conversation that is possible. There are more and more people talking in the public domain, but less and less people are being heard. Uh, there is hardly anybody who's prepared to listen. And, and there are new methods which have been uh, uh, invented to disrupt uh, conversation. Uh, so the, the public arena has, has become very, very coarse. It's filled with all kinds of mumbo jumbo. Uh, what matters is not public reasoning, but uh, you know what? What the 130 crores people, the the will of 130 crores people, as it is discovered by the leader, uh, that's that. So that's one thing that 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 is uh, that's happening. Uh, the truth spent all the time. The facts are thrown into dust into the dustbin. The public arena is flooded with lies, uh, and there is the assumption that you know it, there is a you when you talk that is to say when when powerful people talk in public domain they assume that it's not that people are with them but they assume that everybody the large number of people are with them there is information overload there is everybody's plunged into some kind of a confusion which ultimately silences them the discourse is muddied with falsehoods and disinformation and People don't know anymore how to make uh, how to distinguish truth from falsehood. Uh, it's under these conditions that you know something like post truth is possible, uh, and and in, we we're seeing that happen. Second, 
you know, truth is not just a cognitive uh, value. It's not just a cognitive matter, but a moral issue. Uh, it's not possible uh, to keep lying without sweeping aside morality. And that's exactly what is happening. And uh, uh, people don't care a damn. And those powerful people who want to dominate the public sphere, they, won't, they don't care a damn about morality. The, the, and I'm not speaking of just private morality, but public and political morality, all that has been swept aside. And as a, as a Turkish uh, uh, journalist and author, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name, Eche uh, Temel Kuren, uh, as she says, and, and she bang on, uh, 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 right on, on uh, bang, uh, she, she's absolutely uh, correct on this. Immorality is, is in our current times become hot. Uh, people want to be shameless. Uh, they, they, they don't want to just dirty their hands as politicians have done always in the past. I mean, I feel that in some ways there is no way that a good, good a politician, an effective politician can live without dirtying his or her hands. But what we see today is a spectacular show of those dirty hands and people not just affirming it, but be, being proud of it. And so morality, again, is an inconvenience to be set aside. It's, uh, there is nobody who is prepared to tell what is right from wrong, what is good from bad. All sense of discrimination is lost. It's pernicious moral relativism. Uh, 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 and that is uh, something which uh, is exhibited even more in the shameless way in which people uh, and, and the pride with which people make outrageous statements. Uh, uh, they, they, uh, I hear people say, uh, when, when I, I believe it was the Haryana uh, Agriculture Minister or uh, one of the ministers from the Haryana government who said uh, on the, uh, uh, when he was, when, I mean, somebody asked him about the, the deaths of uh, several hundred farmers I, I believe his response was, well, they would have died even uh, anyway at home. I mean, uh, this kind of uh, callousness or, uh, or uh, things like, you know, young women deserve uh, what, they, what they, they got or goli maro salonko or, I mean, so there's all this pent up uh, 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 kind of uh, populist rage is being used for these reactionary purposes. Uh, and and this is uh, happening uh, more and more, uh, and so we launched an amoral, cognitively cynical order, uh, and uh, uh, and I mean I've already talked about the 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 dismantling of institutions. Uh, another thing, of course, is the the paralyzing of the opposition uh, 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 through various means. It is almost as if opposition, the opposition doesn't exist. Uh, nobody reports uh, 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 on what they're doing. Nobody uh, talks about them. Uh, this is a one, this seems to be a, a one party state. It's an, almost as if other parties are sort of barely surviving, if at all. And uh, not only is it a one party state, it's become, uh, I mean, the distinction between party and state itself seems to have collapsed. So it's become a one party, well, it's, it's become, uh, the party has become the ruler. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, these are signs of a very sick uh, uh, democracy. What we're seeing today is, uh, as a, to, to sum up, uh, social justice being taken out of, of electoral politics. Uh, uh, there is a disconnection between election and governance. Once people are elected, uh, nobody asks whether they will fulfill the promises that they've made. There is completely complete disconnection between election on the one hand and governance on the other. Uh, once people, you know, uh, are elected, they do what the hell they want uh, uh, as they please. And as I said, a vast machinery has been set up to manage elections. Uh, this includes not only buying votes, but all sorts of ways, uh, sometimes legal ways to suppress uh, uh, the votes of the vulnerable. The, the market research being used to target people, uh, the use of psychology uh, to control people. These are pretty sophisticated techniques. 
of distraction, of manipulation, of seduction, um, of shaping people's preferences. So, so you don't have to, to, uh, to prevent uh, elections from taking place. You just have to shape people's preferences and you ensure that the votes will be in your favor. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think I, I, in the end, I would say that uh, this new barbaric capitalism uh, is accompanied now by a, a, a barbaric uh, uh, electoral uh, uh, or I wouldn't even want to call it democracy, and this is a real crisis. It's not just a crisis of the legitimation of, uh, of, of uh, Indian democracy. It is a crisis of a very real crisis of, of democracy itself. Uh, I think uh, uh, we do not have any real democracy, um, except that many of us don't know it. And those who uh, believe uh, it exists no longer believe uh, uh, that, it, that, uh, that, that it exists uh, uh, in this, in the, in the form in which it does. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rajiv Bhagava. Let me take this opportunity to offer our um, gratitude to both Professor Prabhat Patnaik as well as Rajiv Bhagava for very penetrating. Uh, presentations that they've already made. And now we um, should move into the next phase of the uh, lecture program. That would be uh, reflections. And may I request my colleague, Professor G. Arunima, to make her uh, reflections first. Thank you, Professor Sarin. Um Distinguished speakers, uh, Professor K. N. Panikar, and um, all the participants and attendees of this wonderful lecture series that was organized by the Higher Education Council. Thank you, Professor uh, Gurukul, for doing this. Um, I think many, many people, even if they missed the chance to join us today, will certainly listen to the recording. Um, so I thank you for having done this in honor of the Professor Kane Panikal. Um, in the uh, small amount of time that's available to me, I actually want to reflect on Professor Panikal as a builder of institutions and principally the institution that I am presently associated with, the Kerala Council for Historical Research. The reason for doing this is very simple. I think every speaker, one way or the other, has spoken about the kind of crisis that we find in uh, public education, public institutions, and the kind of ways in which the public institution is being destroyed, uh, and the kinds of directions that it's taking with privatization. So given that context, I think it's extremely important to remember the kind of contribution made by uh, such stalwarts as Professor Kay and Panikar in building um, what I hope will be a truly lasting legacy in the context of Kerala. Um, the KCHR, uh, he's the founder chairperson of the KCHR, and he was associated with the Kerala Council for Historical Research for 16 long years. Um, and along with the then director, Dr. Pridhacharyan, they actually laid out a extraordinary range of things for uh, imagining what the KCHR should be. In fact, exceeding the purview of what one normally associates with uh, institutions of this kind. Just to give you a small flavor of this, a variety of projects were undertaken at this time, including building a beautiful library, which I hope many of you will be able to come and use uh, at some point at least building different kinds of archives, uh, the archives of Malayali family histories, uh, the digital archiving, uh, you know, what is called the digitization of Kerala's past, uh, writing the history of uh, Malayali migrants to other parts of the world. We are one of the biggest migrants in this country, at least within and outside. Uh, a huge amount of documentation was undertaken, and we are still doing a lot of that work now. 
writing biographies and collecting biographies, uh, publishing those of women, Dalits, Adivasis, databases on social reform in the state, which has been quite remarkable, one of the earliest places in the country, perhaps, to have had Dalit struggles and uh, social reform based on caste. Um, a range of ways in which uh, not just researchers, but also school students could be brought into the ambit of thinking about history, which I think is extremely important. And many of the people who have spoken today have been involved at different points uh, in their own illustrious, illustrious careers with history and uh, textbook writing uh, processes. Other than that, I think it's important to remember that we have actually inherited, we are very lucky and we have inherited a, a very, very valuable uh, collection of Professor Panikar's own uh, personal library. So he has actually gifted the KCHR a large collection of journals, books, manuscripts, and historical documents. Uh, and I think this really adds value to uh, the KCHR itself. And finally, in this slide, uh, one of the big moments for KCHR was, of course, the excavations that were undertaken at Patanam, uh, putting it on the international map, uh, and that the ability to have the vision to see why a project of that kind would actually transform historical understanding, I think that lies with people who build institutions. And, you know, speaking at a time when history uh, history always is under attack from the right, but at a time when it's uh, desperately under attack and being dismantled as we speak, I think it's important to remember that at least the KCHR is a place which uh, sought to preserve different kinds of histories of um, Kerala and also of Southern India. In this slide, I want to say that we are going into the second edition of publishing Professor K. M. Panikar's collection of essays that was originally published by KCHR in 2016. And I was actually reading some of the essays the other day because um, uh, I will be writing a small piece as a forward to it. And I discovered uh, the wide range of his uh, intellectual and political concerns. And these are essays written all the way from the 1970s to the 2000s his interest in intellectual history, in cultural history, in political processes. Uh, I think Professor Habib and perhaps others also mentioned against Lord and State, which most of us have read and used extensively. Uh, and people like me, of course, have used large amounts of Professor Panikar's writing, those of us who work on Kerala history. But I, what I was struck the most was the collection of essays on contemporary Kerala. These are probably opinion pieces from uh, uh, which were written in the 2000s, particularly uh, in newspapers and journals. And I was struck by the persistent worry that he had, and quite rightly so, that Kerala itself was becoming prey to communal forces. Now, given that we are actually honoring the fact of his sort of immense contribution to thinking secularism in India, I think that this is a very important insight that Professor Panikar had very early on. So soon after the Marad communal uh, violence happened, he wrote a piece that spoke ev evocatively and with great worry about the kind of direction that Kerala was going. And I see this concern repeated time and again in the kind of links that he's making with the growth of the RSS, the place that temples have in doing this, uh, in propagating a certain kind of ideological basis for right-wing presence in Kerala. And I think that this prescient voice is something we do need to take very seriously at a time when uh, whether or not the BJP wins any seat in Kerala in the uh, um, forthcoming uh, legislative assembly, uh, the fact is that their vote share is certainly going up and this is something we do need to bear in mind. Finally, I shall end with a reflection on my days as a student of Professor Panikas. I, was taught by him in the years when I did my master's in JNU at the Center for Historical Studies uh, between 84 and 86. Um, and I have to say that, you know, when I read many of his pieces, I was struck by what he was teaching us, particularly the intellectual history uh, course that I did with him. I have always been struck subsequently when I read pieces that he wrote. I, I could see how 
you know, the ideas and thought move between paper to classroom so seamlessly and beautifully. But what I want to actually remember is something quite different, not the intellectual academic in the classroom, but the very kind teacher who, with whom I did one seminar course formally and another informally, um, mainly because both, uh, both my seminar papers were on Kerala, the other professor whom I asked for help and whose uh, course I registered in wasn't particularly interested in Kerala. And as a result of that, Professor Panikkar's kind guidance, and you know, the interesting thing for those of us who know him is that he's always had a tiny glimmer of a smile at the corner of his mouth. So even if he's saying very kindly things to you, and even if he's advising you very seriously about things, and he really taught us uh, about how the actual nut and bolts writing of history happened. He's the only teacher, I think, who came into class and to ask us, how do you actually footnote? What do you do when you go into an archive? So he actually taught us these kinds of things. But that aside, I think he had a great sense of humor, uh, but he didn't use that to, you know, put us down in any way. On the contrary, I think it helped us uh, not only be more uh, sort of confident in his presence, but also feel great affection towards him. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anonima. Uh, now, may I call upon uh, Kem Sheba to make her reflections? Uh, eminent personalities of the evening and dear Professor Panikar, good evening. Uh, let me begin by congratulating Professor K. M. Panikar for being chosen for the prestigious Skyrally Global Lifetime Achievement Award and express my profound happiness at the decision of the jury. I wish to thank the organizers and Professor Rajan Guruka especially for this rare honor to speak about Professor Panikar in this August gathering. Trying to speak about Professor Panikar on this very special occasion, there are a multitude of memories clamoring for recall. When I visualize a figure of Professor Panikar, his tall gait, looking straight ahead, never bending or stooping, soft footstep walking with firm resolve, for me, it symbolizes his personality. Firm, purposeful, and uncompromising, yet ever so gentle. A long list of scholars, men and women, including me, had the good fortune of working with him. And contrary to any intellectual intimidation, there was a secure sense of working with someone who exhibited a brilliant mix of intellectual direction, adherence to principles, punctuality, care, gender sensitivity, and gentleness. As a supervisor, he was a professor anyone would wish to have intellectually stimulating, sharp in criticism, and unfailing in support. In the classroom, he was a brilliant and passionate teacher. Students knew him as someone who could be depended on in any hour of crisis, academic or personal, much like the benevolent Karnavar. Affairs of administration to him were not simply official, and I particularly recall his commissioning of a mural executed by renowned artist Shamshad Hussain in the School of Social Sciences building, as also the installations by artist Soman near the library, while he was a Dean of School of Social Sciences at JNU. I feel the choice of Shamshad Hussain, son of MF Hussain, was a deliberate choice, as it came at a time when MF Hussain was hounded by right-wing forces. <clears throat> it would be superfluous to recall his widely recognized scholarly contributions here, but I would surely want to underline how he conceptualized historical studies beyond the Rankian frames to weave organic links with the cultural and aesthetic, whether in the discussions on the novel Hindu Lekha, on Ayurveda, or on the Shu question that in a way would herald cultural studies in Kerala. The most striking feature of his personality is his uncompromising opposition to communalism not only at the intellectual realm, but on an everyday individual basis. The demolition of Babri Masjid had been a personal tragedy for him, as I have heard. Besides writing extensively on the communal problem, he continues to be an activist, making himself visible in all possible anti-communal collectives. His commitment to left politics is an exceptional mix of academics and social engagement. The PC Joshi archives that he painstakingly built up in JNU 
will remain as a brilliant repository of the left movement in India. I have heard that he at once very thoughtfully invited the left thinker K. Damodaran to be a part of JNU. His readiness to accommodate all shades of the left from the extreme to the moderate remains a sure sign of his political openness. Despite being a committed leftist, he maintained meaningful and respectful relations with other political viewpoints. I recall uh, with admiration the instance of a student of mine who maintained allegiances to Sangh Parivar politics, holding long conversations with Professor Panikar while he was vice chancellor here in my university, an enriching experience that the scholar often shared. This insistence on dialogue and debate, the spirit of JNU, was internalized by him and reflected in his everyday transactions. His sense of humor is very subtle and refined, and there are one too many anecdotes that students recollect. One such incident was of a visitor arriving at his home on behalf of a senior officer of National Museum to discuss the research that the officer planned to initiate. Professor Panikar, it seems, very patiently heard through the entire proposal. But while bidding farewell to the visitor, he very calmly gave a parting message for the budding researcher. I quote, please tell this person that research cannot be done through emissaries. There may be factual discrepancies in this handed down account, but it is a sure cause for laughter in our JNU student circles in those days. Uh, a little known side of him is that in his early years, he wrote short stories in Malayalam, published in magazines like Gopuram. He retained that aesthetic and artistic angle in historical writings too. His interventions in cultural and intellectual histories are brilliant testimonies to this. Uh, despite his physical distance from Kerala for so long, he kept his Malayali roots alive, reading, discussing and maintaining strong ties, both personal and political with the state and being abreast of affairs here. He was a memorable presence in all Malayali festival gatherings on the campus and a guiding light of all Malayali collective initiatives in the multicultural JNU campus. Never as a dominant figure, but as someone who shared the ethos. However, the Malayali in him never came in the way of his larger personality, in his travels, engagements with issues of different regions, people and landscapes. It was an unforgettable day for me when he took charge as Vice Chancellor of Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit Kaladi, where I work now, under intimidating contexts when none other than the then Minister for Human Resources Development, Murli Manohar Joshi, pronounced veiled threats at his taking charge of a Sanskrit university. Professor Panikar not only brushed aside these threats, but adorned the post with Elan and worked with an inimitable zeal, setting the university on a strong academic track. Throughout his tenure as vice chancellor, he was constantly under pressure to leave. And I distinctly recall his remark that he would have exited, except that the threat and challenge makes him want to stay on. A rare statement that could only be made by a very brave personality. This recollection could be endless, but pressures of time compelled me to conclude while I speak, I have in mind countless other visual images of Professor Panikar, of which a beautiful one is of him walking his beloved dog, Silky, along the paths of the new campus in the evenings. Professor Panikar, as I have known him personally and through the innumerable anecdotes circulated in JNU gatherings, worked quietly and gently, but with unparalleled courage and determination that made a difference. He is an embodiment of the idea of JNU scholarly, secular, democratic, sensitive, committed, courageous, and dedicated, a dignified personality that fits perfectly into the definition of a complete man. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Shiba. Uh, uh, unless there is some other uh, program uh, My, to be... Uh, I take uh, over. Uh, yeah, you yeah. can, yeah. So yes. thanks everybody, thank you. Yes, uh, I am asked to read out the reply speech by Professor K. M. Panikar. Before doing that, let me state that Professor K. M. Panikar is the architect of the Kerala State Higher Education Council, the first of its kind in the country. The Council Act of 2007 has been hailed 
as an ideal one and a model to be emulated by the whole country, Yashpal Committee and UGC uh, recommended this as a, a, a model act to be followed. Now, there are quite a lot of things to speak about uh, by way of his contributions to the coming up of the council, but uh, wanting time, I'm not doing that. In fact, we have another uh, function exclusively for uh, appraisal, uh, making an appraisal of his contributions. Now, uh, let me read out uh, his reply speech. Uh, he is not uh, quite accustomed to the modern uh, technology of communication and also his voice is a bit strained. So I'm reading out his speech. Dear colleagues and friends, I am thankful to the State Higher Education Council, the Council for Historical Research and the Chinda Publications for organizing these lectures. I am also beholden to the colleagues in the profession for delivering scholarly lectures on a very significant theme, democracy, secularism, and socialism. Democracy, secularism, and socialism are vital, are of vital importance for the well-being of the nation. During the last few years, I have been trying to explore their significance as a part of my academic as well as public concern. It is therefore particularly gratifying that my colleagues have chosen to make this theme central to their presentation regarding the contemporary Indian society. The independent India sought to build the nation on the basis of the ideas inherited from the anti-colonial struggle. The anti-colonial struggle was a multifaceted endeavor that tried to regain the identity of the nation by constructing a modern society. It was not a struggle for the emancipation from colonialism, but also for realizing certain core political values. Among them, democracy was central and secularism and socialism integral. Given this integral character, the freedom movement was focused on realizing a secular and egalitarian social order with one, the other two would, would not be a reality. Therefore, the struggle for democracy was as much as the struggle for secularism and socialism. The goal of secularism and socialism remained a part of the political perspective during the colonial struggle and continued to guide the nation. Times have changed and the idea of secular nationalism has come under severe strain. The Indian society in recent times is subject to considerable irrationality and social obscurantism as well as political backwardness. The tradition of modern India seems to be slipping towards medieval irrationality instead of replacing colonial modernity and critical modernity. I mean, replacing colonial modernity with critical modernity Modernity is being discarded in preference to absorbed notions of belief. Equally grievous, equally grievously, social welfare measures have been discarded in favor of capitalist development. And in the process, democratic values have given way to authoritarianism. It is necessary that these changes are discouraged seriously, not just by the intelligentsia, but by the public as well. I hope that this series of lectures will stimulate discussions and help discover the nation. I once again thank you all for your generosity. Now, from <clears throat> my side, I join uh, Mr. C.P. Narayanan, former member Rajya Sabha and the chief editor, Chinda Publications, and Michael Tharagan to express our immense gratitude to all these uh, eminent speakers. And then 
panikas on students who made uh, delightfully informative and as serious reflections uh, thank you all and other insiders i i don't have to thank formally so thank you all once again thank you very much now the meeting has come to an end thank you thank you